Hey there. Today I want to tell you about a new case heading to the Supreme Court of Canada. The federal government is arguing that they have absolute immunity from being sued by citizens who have been hurt by unconstitutional laws. Even once the courts have struck down those laws as unconstitutional, the government in Ottawa is saying people hurt by those laws are not entitled to sue. Even if the law was clearly wrong, enacted in bad faith, or was an abuse of power. Now, we think that that is completely wrong and unacceptable. We believe the government must face consequences for unconstitutional laws, and one of those consequences can be a lawsuit for damages brought by the people who are hurt by that law. We have been granted intervener status at the Supreme Court in this case to make that argument. You can also sign our petition about this issue at the ccf.ca slash immunity. Now I can't wait to tell you all about the case. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Christine and I'm the litigation director for the Canadian Constitution Foundation, a legal charity that fights for fundamental freedoms in Canada. I upload regular videos about our ongoing cases and about other interesting developments in constitutional law in Canada. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, please hit like and subscribe below. It really helps my videos out a lot. Also, please remember nothing in my video is legal advice. If you have your own legal question or problem, please consult your own lawyer. So the case heading to the Supreme Court is called the Attorney General and Power. And it involves a man named Joseph Power who was convicted of two criminal offenses for sexual assault in the 1990s, and he was sentenced to 16 months imprisonment. He served his term, and then after his release became an x-ray technician. He then worked in Quebec and then relocated to New Brunswick, where he worked in a hospital as a medical radiation technologist. In 2010, he made inquiries about the process to obtain a, par a pardon for his conviction, but he didn't actually apply for a pardon at that time. In 2011, his employer at the hospital learned about his cr criminal record because they received an anonymous phone call, and he was told that he posed a risk because of his criminal record, and he was suspended from work first with pay and then later without pay. In 2013, Mr. Power applied for that pardon, but by that time, the government and the regime for pardons uh, at that time called a record suspension, the whole regime had changed. There was an, a new enactment in 2010 that amended the pardon scheme, and it included some transitional provisions that made the, the whole new regime retrospective, so backward looking. And the combined effect of those new enactments and the transitional provisions was basically to render Mr. Power permanently ineligible for a pardon or a record suspension. And as a result, he lost his job and he became ineligible for membership with the medical radiation technologist uh, governing bodies in of, of New Brunswick and in Quebec. Now those laws, the transitional provisions that gave the new regime on pardons or record suspension, they gave them that backward looking effect. Those were challenged in court and have since been declared unconstitutional. So as a result of that, Mr. Power, who he says he suffered damages as a result of that unconstitutional law, he brought a civil action for damages pursuant to section 24.1 of the charter. The issue is now heading to the Supreme Court and the issue of the appeal is very narrow. The question is whether or not the Crown, the government enjoys absolute immunity from a civil suit seeking charter damages for the enactment of legislation declared unconstitutional. The Attorney General says it does get absolute immunity and power who says he suffered damages flowing out of that unconstitutional legislation says it, it says the opposite, he says otherwise. The lower courts applied existing case law, specifically a case called Mackin in New Brunswick, which I will explain in a little bit. They used that case to conclude that Crown immunity is not absolute. And so the attorney general is appealing that decision. I think that the attorney general's position is wrong and quite 
extreme. They're arguing that parliament and the executive branch of government are protected from all liability when performing essentially legislative functions because of immunity founded on the principles of parliamentary privilege and the constitutional division of powers between the legislature, executive, and judicial branches of government. So the courts can't look at what the legislature did and award damages. They have immunity from that. Now, that argument made by the Attorney General was not accepted by the Court of Appeal in this case, the Court of Appeal of New Brunswick, and they found that Crown officials do not enjoy absolute immunity, and they applied this case, Mackin and New Brunswick. The decision in the Mackin case says that the Crown can be liable for damages for the enactment of legislation, but only when a very, very high threshold is met, and the state conduct needs to have been clearly wrong in bad faith or an abuse of power. And those are terms that we use in law all the time. For example, if the law was enacted with the knowledge that it was unconstitutional or for ulterior motives, then that threshold could be met. So in the Mackin case, the court was considering New Brunswick's decision to amend the Provincial Court Act, which abolished the province's system of supernumerary judges. Now. If in that case, the record had showed that the amendments that the government brought in had the, some ulterior or bad faith intention, like the intention to undermine judicial independence or to punish political adversaries or for some other improper purpose, the legislature would not have had a good governance rationale for justifying immunity from charter damages. The government has some immunity, but that immunity ends where it does not serve the objective and instead is an abuse of power or done in bad faith. Now I'll give you another example, and this one is from history. In the history of England, Parliament used to enact something called a Bill of Attainder. This was an act of the legislature declaring a person or a group of people guilty of some crime and punishing them, often without a trial. And the first time it was used was in 1321 against the first Earl of Winchester and his son, who were both attained for supporting the uh, King Edward II. Bills of attainder passed in Parliament in England by King Henry VIII in 1542 resulted in the executions of a number of historical figures and the United States was so opposed to this notion of, of bills of attainder that they actually forbid it in their constitutions. Every state constitution expressly forbids bills of attainder, and the U.S. Supreme Court has invalidated laws under the attainder clause five times. Now, you might think that these are all old examples, but Canada has arguably tried to pass bills of attainder twice. Now, in those two cases, the people who Parliament was concerned with, who they were in act, who were trying to pass these bills of attainder related to, they are people who none of us would have any sympathy for. They were uh, child killer K Clifford Olson and Carla Homolka. Now, ultimately, those two bills did not pass because the speakers of the House of Commons and the Senate, respectively, where these two bills had been brought, they ruled them out of order. And these, of course, are some of the worst people in Canada's history. So maybe you might think these are not good examples, but simply put, this is not how our system is intended to work. We should be concerned that governments have a history of passing laws that are abusive and even in bad faith, and that this is a very th high threshold, but that is the threshold. So how would you feel if the government passed a bill specifically targeting you? or targeting one of their political enemies, or someone who may be unpopular in the mainstream, but maybe for whatever reason you happen to like them. I want to come down in this case on the side of limiting government's power to do this. The state has never been entitled to absolute immunity for claims of damages under Section 24.1, and individuals have a right to sue, in my opinion, when the high threshold of set out in Mackin is met, so bad faith or abuse of power. Now, the Court of Appeal found in this case, in the power case, that Mackin was correctly applied, but that the threshold wasn't met, that there was not a abuse of power or a bad faith intention here. And keep in mind that the Mackin threshold gives a lot of deference. So the appeal at the New Brunswick Court of Appeal was dismissed. 
But the Attorney General is now appealing to the Supreme Court of Canada to argue that there can be no Crown liability for the enactment of legislation that may be found to be unconstitutional because they say that there is absolute immunity arising from the separation of powers, parliamentary sovereignty, and parliamentary privilege. We've been granted intervener status in this case, and we will be arguing that the lower court, the Court of Appeal, was correct to apply the Mackin principle when determining if Mr. Power was eligible for charter damages. The decision in Mackin requires that the Crown be liable for damages as I said, when that very high threshold is met, clearly wrong, in bad faith or an abuse of power. We will argue that the Crown does not have absolute immunity for damages arising out of unconstitutional legislation in those cases, but we are not actually taking a position on whether or not, in this case, if, if damages should be uh, awarded. We're not taking a position on if Mr. Power's case was an abuse of power or whether it was done in bad faith. So I think that this case, if it, if it goes the attorney general's way, could cause major problems from people for people who have suffered as a result of unconstitutional laws. If the Supreme Court accepts that argument from the attorney general that the Crown has absolute immunity, people will be unable to seek compensation when governments act in bad faith. For example, those bills of attainder examples. We're going to be arguing that the current threshold is the correct one. It allows people to seek those damages in those exceptionally high cases, because I think that to deny charter damages to people who have suffered because of a bad faith or abuse of power, that would just be completely intolerable in our system. The threshold's very high, it's difficult to meet, but the government doesn't deserve absolute immunity. This is a really important case about limited government and allowing people to pursue damages against government is just one of the ways that we limit government overreach. It's a form of accountability for citizens who have been hurt by the government. And the government is seeking to expand its powers by arguing that it is immune to damages. Now, as I said, we're not taking a position on the merits of the case or even the question of whether the threshold to claim damages was met in this case. I mean, the, the applicant, Mr. Power, he's a convicted sex offender. He's tried to reintegrate into society. And I understand that this, some people may think that that is a sympathetic story. He's tried to reintegrate, but other people think it will think it's not sympathetic. He is a convicted sex offender. But from my perspective, it actually doesn't matter whether Mr. Power is sympathetic or not, um, or whether his lawsuit against the government would be successful or not. What matters is that he can sue. The government thinks he can't, and in fact, thinks that no one can, ever. And while I don't know if Mr. Power's suit would be successful or not, or whether the standard was met in this case, certainly it's possible that some government conduct could meet that threshold in some case. We just don't want to live in a system where the government will always have absolute immunity. That is a simple concept to understand, even if the facts of Mr. Power's case are more complicated. Now, I'll add one thing here, which is that there is an interesting debate about the division of powers that's raised in this case and which has been raised on social media as well in response to our intervention. So some people argue that parliamentary sovereignty and respect for the separation of powers prevents the court from inquiring into the legislative process for the purposes of determining whether damages should be awarded for a charter breach. And that it would actually be impossible to determine the intent of the legislature for the purposes of establishing bad faith. Uh, it's, it would require looking into the intent of the legislature as a whole, as opposed to inquiring into the intent of some individual members of parliament or members of provincial parliament. And some liberty-minded folks who I am friends with have raised these arguments. But I have to say, I still come down strongly on the side of limiting state power. Parliament already has an obligation to act within the confines of the constitution and courts aren't interfering with or controlling the legislative process when determining if a violation occurred and determining if immunity applies or not. Courts can look into whether bad faith or an abuse of power existed in the enactment of the law, but this is a very, very high threshold and looking into it doesn't meddle in any way in the legislative process. Let me know what you think though. Do you think we should be able to sue the government when they enact unconstitutional laws in bad faith and that are an abuse of power? What types of cases do you think 
might fall into that category of a bad faith, unconstitutional law or, or an abuse of power? Or do you have sympathy for that argument about the division of powers? I'm interested to know what you think about this case because it is contentious among even those of us who are quite liberty minded. Now, the case is being heard in December and we are being represented by the law firm Baker McKenzie and that's the same law firm that represented us in the Jordan Peterson Freedom of Expression case. If you wanna stay up to date with what happens with this issue, with this case, you can sign our petition at the ccf.ca slash nogovimmunity. If there's someone who you think would enjoy this video, please share it with them. That really helps my videos out a lot and don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for watching and let's keep fighting for freedom in Canada. Bye.